The second postulate of special theory of relativity tells us that the speed of light in vacuum is the same for all inertial observers. It means that if I as an observer at rest measure the speed of light in vacuum, then I will measure it to be c. If another observer traveling at very high speeds measures the speed of light in vacuum, he will also measure the speed of light to be c. Two observers in relative motion, both of them will measure the speed of light to be exactly the same. This simple fact in special theory of relativity has its consequences. The fact that two observers which are in relative motion measure the speed of light to be the same, they end up measuring distances and time periods to be different. Hi, I'm Divya Jyoti Das and this is For the Love of Physics. Today I'm going to talk about, you guessed it, time dilation. Time dilation is a very interesting and yet a very bizarre phenomena in nature which comes directly as a consequence of the special theory of relativity. Now in our day-to-day -day life, when we think of time, we have this inherent intuitive idea which is very much familiar to the ones in Newtonian mechanics that time is something that flows in the same manner for everybody. For a person at rest, for a person in motion, time is something that flows at the same rate. This is a commonsensical idea that we have, but nature does not work like that. And Albert Einstein proved that this very simple commonsensical idea is actually not true. Objects that are in relative motion, objects that are traveling at very, very high speeds, speeds compared to the speed of light, they function as if their clocks are dilated. The time periods that they experience with respect to an observer at rest appears to slow down. So for example, if I have a simple clock with me, you know how clocks work? It goes tick, tick, tick. And this time period in which it goes tick gives us an idea about its proper time. So for example, I have this clock with me at rest. I am holding it. So the time periods that I am going to measure is the proper time, the rest time. If I start traveling at very high velocities, and the clock is with me, I am holding the clock as I am traveling at very, very high velocities, the clock is still going tick, tick, tick. And if I measure the time period, it is still the rest time or the proper time because I am at rest with respect to this particular clock. However, if this same watch or clock starts moving in relative motion with respect to me, in that case, my measurement of the same tick, tick, tick happening will slow down according to me. If the clock is traveling at very high velocities with respect to me, then I will see that the tick, tick, tick slows down. The unit time period gets dilated. It means that if I measure the time period of physical events that are in relative motion with respect to me, then the time period that I measure will end up appearing dilated compared to if I would have measured the time period in their frame of reference in rest with respect to those physical events. Now this idea has nothing to do with clocks or their mechanical construction. You may take a clock which is built on electronic equipments. You may take a clock which is built on optical equipments. You may look at biological clocks. All of them are related to this flow of physical time. And the consequence of relativity is that this flow of physical time itself gets dilated with respect to an observer in relative motion. And that is what I'm going to prove today using a very simple setup and using the Lorentz transformations. So here I have two observers, All right? So let's suppose this is a lab frame, an observer at rest with respect to the board. And this is a moving frame, an observer in motion with respect to the lab frame. So let's suppose the moving frame is traveling at a velocity of v with respect to the lab frame. I have associated the Cartesian coordinate reference frames with respect to both these observers, x, y, z, and x dash, y dash, z dash axis, which are respectively parallel to each other. So let's suppose that at time t is equal to zero, the origins of both of these coordinate axes 
coincide but because there is a relative motion the second frame starts moving forward as time passes. So if I want to make measurements of some physical event from the perspective of both these two observers, then those measurements will be related by what is known as the Lorentz transformations. Now let me take two physical events and measure the time period between those two physical events compared to both the two observers. I may take the ticking of a clock or I may take any other physical events happening one after another. So let's suppose that both these two observers have their own uh, watches or clocks that has been synchronized before we start performing this experiment so that they are comparing these time periods of physical events with respect to synchronized clocks and they are using these clocks to measure the time period between different physical events. So let me define two physical events for you. Let's suppose that in the moving frame the observer who is a scientist uh, has a bulb and the bulb lights up once and after some time the bulb lights up again. So the first time the bulb lights up, I call that physical event A and the second time the bulb lights up, I call it physical event B. So there are two physical events happening at different points in time but at exactly the same location with respect to the observer in the moving frame. This is important here. The physical event must be happening at rest with respect to the observer in the moving frame. Although the physical event is at motion with respect to the observer in the lab frame, it is at rest with respect to the observer in the moving frame. This is because I'm interested in finding out the time period between those two events in the frame of reference in which we will calculate the proper time period. So if these two physical events are happening, the bulb lights up once, physical event A, the bulb lights up after some time, physical event B, then I mention the coordinates of those two physical events with respect to both the observers, right? The physical events are happening at the location of x a dash and x b dash with respect to the observer in the moving frame. And because with respect to the observer in the moving frame, the bulb is at rest, I say that x a dash is equal to x b dash. That means the position of the bulb does not change with respect to the observer in the moving frame. However, with respect to the observer in the lab frame, the positions are, let's suppose, XA and XB. Now, XA and XB are not necessarily the same because the entire setup is moving in a particular direction with respect to the observer in the lab frame. What about the time periods? Let's suppose the time at which physical event A happens with respect to an observer in the moving frame is TA dash and the time at which the physical event B happens is TB dash with respect to the same observer. Similarly, the time period at which the physical event a happens is TA with respect to observer in the lab frame and TB with respect to the observer in the lab frame. So as you see, the coordinates in the x-axis and the coordinates along the time axis are different for both these two observers for both the two physical events. What is the time period between these two physical events? In the first physical event, bulb lights up. In the second physical event, the bulb lights up after some time. The time period between these two events will be different for both these two observers. That is the most important uh, conclusion that we have to draw from here. You see in Newtonian mechanics, the time period between let's suppose B minus A, TB minus TA, which is the time period between both these two physical events with respect to observer in the lab frame should be equal to the time period between both the physical events TB dash minus TA dash with respect to the observer in the moving frame. That is the commonsensical notion that we apply in Newtonian mechanics. However, in special theory of relativity, this expression is not valid. In special relativity, both these two time periods with respect to both these two observers is not the same. So let's suppose I name TB minus TA as del T. This is the time period between both the physical events A and B as measured by our observer in the lab frame. And I say that TB dash minus TA dash is equal to del T dash, which is the time period between both the physical events with respect to the moving frame observer. Now, the physical events, which is the switching on of a light, is at rest. The process is happening at rest with respect to the observer in the moving frame. Therefore, the measurements by the observer in the moving frame will correspond to the proper time period. So this is in fact the proper time period.
proper time or rest time is that time period between physical events which is measured by an observer at rest with respect to the frame of reference in which that physical events are happening. While relativistic time periods will be measured by the lab frame of reference because with respect to the lab frame, the physical events are in relative motion. Now, what is the relationship between these quantities that can be easily obtained by applying the Lorentz transformations? Now, the Lorentz transformation contains four equations connecting x, y, z, t with x dash, y dash, z dash, t dash. However, we don't need the first three equations. We only need the equation corresponding to time. The equation corresponding to time tells us that t dash is equal to gamma t minus v x upon c square. However, here I'm going to apply the inverse Lorentz transformation, which is nothing but t is equal to gamma t dash plus v x dash upon c square. The reason I'm going to be applying inverse Lorentz transformations here is because I already said that the physical events must be in the rest frame of reference where I'm measuring the proper time interval. So I want to apply this particular condition and to apply that particular condition, I'll be applying the inverse Lorentz transformations. That will make it easier for us. So for the physical event A, T A is simply equal to what? Gamma T A dash plus V X A dash upon C square. And for the physical event B, we have T B is equal to gamma T B dash plus V X B dash upon C squared. From here, let us find the difference between the time periods. So the difference between the time periods can be given as T B minus T A is equal to gamma and then we have tb dash minus ta dash and then we have plus v upon c square xb dash minus xa dash. Now what did I tell you about xb dash minus xa dash? Both are the same positions because the bulb is at rest with respect to the observer in the moving frame and the bulb lights up once and then it lights up again. So these two positions are nothing but the same so they will end up giving you zero. So xb dash minus xa dash is equal to zero. So finally, I end up getting tb minus ta, which is the time period as measured by the lab frame observer, that is del t is equal to gamma tb dash minus ta dash, which is a time period as measured by an observer in the moving frame, which is simply nothing but del t dash. This my dear friends, is the relationship between the time periods measured by both these two observers in relative motion. Now, you may know what gamma is. Gamma is the factor of 1 upon root over 1 minus v square upon c square. So if I want to write it a little bit better fashion, let me write it down here. So del t is equal to del t dash upon root over 1 minus v square upon c square. This is the time dilation formula. Del t is equal to del t dash upon root over 1 minus v square upon c squared. As you can see, the time periods between the same physical events as measured by two different observers is not the same. The time periods measured by two different observers of the same physical event is not the same. This is time dilation. As you see, del t is greater than del t dash because this is one upon root over one minus v square by c square for velocities less than the speed of light, del t is greater than del t dash. That's why time dilation happens. Time periods between physical events appear to be dilated. They are larger when compared to the proper time interval. So if some physical event is happening, for example, the physical event of the mechanical motion inside this clock that is going tick, 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 and these physical events are in relative motion with respect to me, then my measurements of the time periods of those tick, tick, tick will appear to be dilated. They will go slowly. This is the very uh, bizarre and interesting conclusion of the special theory of relativity. The fact that two different inertial observers 
moving at different velocities can measure the speed of light to be the same ends up measuring the time periods between the same physical events to be different. And this has nothing to do with the mechanical motion of clocks or the mechanical me mechanism in which clocks are operating, but rather the very idea of time itself, whether it is a biological clock or whether you measure clock based on some, some other system or some optical system, some electronic system, whatever it is, all physical events will happen in such a manner that when measured by an observer in relative motion, they will appear to go slowly. This is the idea of time dilation, one of the very interesting concepts in special theory of relativity. In my next video, I'm going to talk about an experimental proof of this kind of a time dilation expression because you see, these expressions become valid only at very, very high velocities. At very low velocities, this factor, 1 upon root over 1 minus v square upon c square is not significant at all. We are talking about velocities comparable to the speed of light, 50% the speed of light, 90% the speed of light, only then this factor becomes significant. So whenever you look at the motion of subatomic particles, in that case, their time periods and their clocks start appearing dilated. So in my next video, I'm going to talk about a very interesting problem of muon decay. So muons are these particles that travel at very, very high velocities through the atmosphere and they have a very short lifespan. But because of time dilation, the time period that it takes for them to decay is much, much larger when measured by an observer in, in the rest frame of reference. So I'm going to talk about this interesting problem of subatomic particles and how their motion is affected by time dilation in the next video. This is all for today. Thank you very much.